Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. You're getting a bonus Tuesday upload this week because I decided uh, that after being gone for a week and seeing a lot happen in that time, it was probably worth doing at least a little tiny news roundup video just going to give my thoughts on some of the stuff that happened this past week or so. Uh, in the Overwatch League scene, in the Overwatch League community. A lot of stuff happened, a lot of big kind of stories broke, so I figured let's just jump in and let's talk about some of them and kind of dive into uh, what happened while I was away. So let's start with the big obvious story. Um, this one broke uh, last uh, Tuesday, actually, a week ago uh, today. Uh, and that is, of course, the news that the Chengdu Hunters are not, uh, at least for now, going to be competing in the Overwatch League 2023 season. The Overwatch League shared a statement saying, Ahead of our season start, we wanted to share with the community that the Chengdu Hunters are not included in today's schedule announcement as they continue to contemplate the future direction of their team. We will update the community further when we have more information to share. For the upcoming spring knockout stage, there will now be six Overwatch League teams in the East region, and they will accom be accompanied by six qualified contenders teams. Both regions of the Overwatch League will still begin the season next week, which is now this week, and we are excited to announce that our season schedule is now live. We look forward to celebrating the best Overwatch 2 players in the world with you all. This was, you know, one of those stories that a lot of us kind of figured with this was happening in one you know, some way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, there's been rumors and stuff about this team potentially disbanding. Obviously, last year they had a very, very small roster. They had financial issues last year. The parent organization for the Chengdu Hunters essentially has gone bankrupt. Uh, they've been not fully bankrupt, but they've been very much struggling economically. They've had a lot of economic issues and stuff like that. Um, so it makes sense that the team would kind of be one of the first things on the cutting floor uh, when you look at a team that you know, realistically, you're not going to get a lot out of them uh, from a parent organization where they just don't have the money really to um, kind of manage a team. There were some rumors I saw about there being like hunters players like on like the like the the player and like league server where they have like the ability to scrim and stuff like there is uh, a separate server where the the players and stuff go. And there are Hunters accounts on that that apparently were in use. I don't know what the situation with that is. I don't know what's going on there. I'm just going to assume um, that that was some, you know, weird where maybe old players were on that account or maybe the account's getting shut down or something like that. I don't know exactly what it was. Um, but yeah, no Chengdu Hunters this year, uh, which stinks. I think the fact that they are the first team to kind of go under, if you will, is really unfortunate. Obviously, there's been a ton of issues with the Overwatch League. Um, and it's, you know, kind of economic status. And I'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second. Uh, but it, it really is unfortunate to kind of see the Overwatch League lose a team, right? Go back down to 19. While at the same time, we're seeing the increase by adding in contenders teams. And we saw some, you know, pro-am play. So it's this weird place where on one end you have a team leaving the league, though not guaranteed forever. There's a chance that they come back at some point in time. Um... And then at the same time, you also have all of these contenders teams and other new talent that we're seeing kind of infused into the league. And we're seeing tons of new things happening in the Overwatch esports scene. So it's weird to see, um, you know, the, a team go down. But it's interesting to kind of see how Overwatch esports is evolving. Because this year alone, we have the Overwatch League, we have the World Cup, we have Calling All Heroes, we have Contenders, we have the Pro-Am from earlier this year, we have the, you know, the spring stage and stuff with the eastern region contenders teams kind of getting a spot uh, to compete for the overwatch league tournament so it's really interesting to look at what we're seeing here with how overwatch esports is evolving right and while the overwatch league may be kind of in a somewhat rough place overwatch esports is seemingly in a better place than it was a year ago two years ago um, it's growing, it's evolving, we're kind of getting back to a point where the game seems to be at least popular enough to essentially uh, be a stronger kind of thing than it was. And that was that kind of issue involving Overwatch Esports became an even further problem 
uh, when the kind of th that whole big thing going on with the Overwatch League returning to YouTube uh, kind of popped up and, and people are kind of upset and annoyed. And obviously there's kind of two camps of people. There's there's people who say, I don't understand why they just don't go back to Twitch. They have higher viewership on Twitch and they would be, do better with viewership on Twitch. And you have people like Uber who put out a, a, a video. Um, he streamed and he kind of talked about it. I'll link to the video in the description. I actually watched it on my flight home. Uh, so, um, you know, that, that kept me uh, in the loop while I was away. Um, and he kind of gave the opinion that I think is generally speaking the best, which is there are a lot of reasons why YouTube is better than going to Twitch. But the number one thing is if you want the Overwatch League to still be a thing, you need the broadcast deal that YouTube gives to the Overwatch League, right? You can say all you want that the that the broadcast deal hurts viewership numbers. At the end of the day, the Overwatch League needs money to operate and the viewership deal or a, a broadcast deal gives them that. They need sponsors, right? And and that's where the majority of the money comes from. And I think a lot of what we, when we look at the kind of financial issues that kind of the Overwatch League has and esports in general has, it's really about how do you get the consumers to spend money, right? And there's a whole topic that, you know, could be an entire video in and of itself um, in terms of how to get people to spend money. I don't have all the answers, but I definitely think it's interesting to kind of see where things are. But it makes sense why Overwatch League is back on YouTube. Obviously, if you have been around the channel long enough, you know I prefer it on YouTube than Twitch. I don't care about Twitch. Like, Twitch does not give me the experience that I want. I don't really care about having a chat. I don't really care about emotes or anything like that. And I think when you consider the fact that Twitch doesn't really need the Overwatch League or necessarily want it, Google and YouTube have a much greater reason to want it on their platform because they have a desire to have a premier esport, right? League is the biggest esport, right? Valorant is a huge esport, and those are both pretty much heavily on Twitch. The Overwatch League is not bigger than either of those things. YouTube can have, you know, both of those things, but they want to have a premier esports title. They want to have a big title, and they want to have some kind of guarantee that they're going to be able to be involved in the esports scene. The Overwatch League, Activision Blizzard, wants to continue their relationship with Google that they've been developing for a long time. So it all makes sense. I think from a viewer perspective, as someone who wants to be able to easily watch VODs, who has to get VODs for content, um, you know, the, the stuff you watch on this channel, my the, all the background footage, if it doesn't come from YouTube, it is very, very much a hassle to try to get content because it's digging through rabbit holes, getting Twitch VODs is a nightmare, all that type of stuff. So Having access to streams as easily as you do through YouTube, it's easier to watch it on multiple platforms. There's a whole lot of reasons why I prefer YouTube. And as a YouTube content creator, I more benefit from it being on YouTube. And that's the selfish reason. Much like how Uber said the selfish reason for the Overwatch League, uh, having this YouTube deal is that without it, they probably couldn't afford Uber, right? For me, selfish reason why I like it on YouTube is that it means more eyes are on YouTube watching Overwatch content, which means they're more likely to see my content, right? Like there are obvious reasons why I prefer it. I also just prefer YouTube as a platform. I don't watch Twitch. I don't care about watching Twitch streamers. It's just not my style. Um, you know, there's the occasional streamer that I like to watch. I do like Critical Role and I watch that on Twitch sometimes. I watch it on YouTube most of the time. Um, but sometimes I miss a, a, a stream. And so I watch the, the VOD that goes up immediately after through being a Twitch subscriber, right? So like, do I watch Twitch sometimes? Absolutely. I'm not saying I never use Twitch, but as a person, I prefer YouTube as a platform. So I am in favor of the Overwatch League being on YouTube. I've talked about it a bunch in the past. I'm not going to talk about it too much. People have different w reasons for wanting it to be on Twitch. For a lot of people, viewership numbers are important. Chat is important. I don't care about that stuff. Uh, I want a better product. I think a product that looks better is always going to be better. That is more easily accessible um, in terms of people who are watching it live. People want to go back and rewind stuff. YouTube is a way better player in that way. Um, and I think that makes for a better viewing experience. But for some people, that's not what makes a better viewing experience. So I understand that that's kind of the difference and the disconnect between certain people where they prefer the kind of social side of Twitch. Uh, and some people prefer the more technical side of YouTube. Uh, 
and, and I'm, I'm on that, that second camp of I definitely prefer the YouTube kind of more technical camp. And I just think it, it for me, is the better experience. But I understand why it's not for everyone. Um, I do th agree with the idea that people have, like, in an ideal world, the Overwatch League wouldn't have to have a broadcast deal. They would have enough money through sponsorships and um, other means, you know, through Activision Blizzard, maybe Microsoft in the future, where they can say, we don't need an exclusivity deal, and we can just put it on both YouTube and Twitch, have it on both of those platforms, and just have sponsor money that, you know, supports the league well enough, right? But that's just not where things are right now, so that isn't the thing. They don't have any sponsors. That needs to be their big push, is focusing on getting money where they can, building up sponsors. That's what's most important. And so that's why I do agree with the idea that YouTube is the right platform, because it is the platform that's giving them money. And that's why it matters as much as it does. But let's go to some more positive stories, obviously. The first two here, a little bit more negative. So let's try to end this video out with some positive stuff. Though some people have different opinions on what is and isn't positive in this case. So it is what it is. But I think it's positive, so I'm going to talk about it as a positive thing. We got the reveal for the 2023 talent team. And all I will say is I am so excited for the talent lineup we have this year. We have most of the same desk as what we had in the uh, 2022 season. Though Custa has moved into a, a, a casting role now, so he's no longer on the desk. Instead, we have Jake, which is a good thing, obviously. Jake is the type of guy you don't just let him leave the scene. He's, you know, been uh, one of the best players. He's one of the most kind of well-known coaches and personalities in the scene. He's moving into a more kind of uh, focusing less on being competitive and more on kind of his life and, and his personal life and stuff with his family. So this is kind of the best possible role, I think, for him. It gives him a little bit more stability, um, and it also just gives him something that he can still be a big part of the scene and a big part of the game. So I love that we're getting Jake. I think the Sully Jake reinforced Danny desk will be very, very good. I think that Custa moving into being a caster is not a loss in, by any means. I think it's one of those things that's a horizontal move, right? It's, you know, addition by subtraction uh, for the desk, but also at the same time, it's an addition in other ways, right? It's, it's one of those weird things. I don't think the desk is going to be better or worse with Jake. I think it's going to be different. And I think it's going to be the same kind of analysis. But I also think that Custa being a caster is always nice to see. I love seeing analysts and desk hosts move to casting. We saw with Brandon Sideshow, they were phenomenal. I think Cus has done a great job casting so far, and I'm excited he's with Jaws. Um, Jaws has had, if you look at him for the past five years of his casting career with Overwatch, he has had a different partner every year. He was with Leg Day back in 2019, Hex in 2020, Vicky in 2021, Necro 2022, and now 2023, he is with Custa. He is really building the infinity gauntlet of casting pairs because he has cast with everybody at this point in time. But then we have the other kind of duos that, you know, are returning with Uber, Mr. X, Lemmy, Kiwi, and Leg Day, Achilles and Avril, phenomenal duos, plus Vicky and Necra, the Vikra duo, which is the only way that I will ever refer to it. That is what it should be. It's the Vikra duo, but I digress. They are a kind of new duo of two kind of people who have cast, obviously, together. They cast in the Pro-Am. I thought they were phenomenal. I really like the the pairs we have this year. I always think one of the interesting, interesting things with casters is sometimes you have a caster where you feel ambivalent towards them, or you're like, oh, I don't really know how I feel about this person's casting. And, and, and you see different community reactions, and, and a lot of them are positive, but a lot of them are unfortunately negative. Um, and then you see someone, you, you see the same caster in a different uh, casting like duo and a different like partnership, and all of a sudden they just click, and everything is so much better than it was. And it really kind of shows you sometimes that sometimes casters are quote-unquote bad because they're in the wrong situation, and when you put them in the right situation, they're better, right? Some duos just don't work super well. The example I will use the most is last year, when you would have Trid fill in sometimes for Avril uh, or Achilles. Usually he filled in for Achilles, who's busy doing other stuff. Trid and Avril, I think their first couple of casts, it was pretty rough. You could tell they didn't have the dynamic down. They didn't know what they were doing as well. They, you know, they 
They didn't know how to play off of each other as well. But as time went on, and as they did more and more casts with each other, I thought that the Trid Avril duo was one of my favorite duos to listen to, because they both are really great casters who know what they're talking about. They just had to figure out how to get their dynamic to work. And once it clicked, it clicked, and I thought they were incredible, right? And so I think that's what I'm excited about this year, you know, to kind of see how the Vicky and Necro dynamic, you know, compares to what you had with Vicky and Jaws and Vicky and uh, Trid and also Necra and Jaws last year. Plus now Jaws and Custa, a duo who we've seen a bit in the past, but I want to see kind of how they really kind of get to, to have a full season uh, together. So I'm really excited for this year's casting uh, and talent. I'm really glad that we're seeing pretty much all of the same people returning. I think the league is really figuring out how to really get everyone together and really kind of keep the same pieces around. And then they figured out the talent they like, and they figured out the people that have done, in my opinion, consistently some of the best job in the scene as a whole. And they're holding on to the people who do great things. Obviously in this uh, spring series thing going on in Contenders right now, we have the return of Hex and ZP, which is really cool. Uh, I hope we get to see Trid at some point this year. I know there's been some, he mentioned some kind of issues with scheduling that then just resulted in them just not bringing him on at all. Um, do you think it's unfortunate? If he's kind of like their emergency guy, I think that would be cool. I think that would be awesome to see. We'll see what happens. Obviously, an unfortunate loss there because I do really like Trid as a caster. But um, I am also very excited to see kind of this group that we have now uh, go into the 2023 season. Let's now move on to the final kind of topic. They're connected, uh, which is this past weekend, we saw the conclusion of the first Calling All Heroes event for the 2023 year. I really love Calling All Heroes. Uh, if you follow me on Twitter, it's not that big of a surprise. Um, I really much, I very much like to hype up uh, events like this. I think Game Changers is a great event in Valorant. And when they announced Kong All Heroes, I was incredibly excited because I think it's super important to have these kinds of events in uh, your esports scene. And I think being able to uh, bring up and elevate and kind of allow people from marginalized groups to be able to perform at a high level is always a very good thing. It gives them more resources that have traditionally not been available to them. And so I'm very excited for that. Uh, and it was cool to see uh, Timeless Ethereal win the first event of the year with a 3-0 victory over NYXL Academy, who we'll talk about here in a second. But I think it's really awesome to kind of see these teams play well. It's always nice to see uh, kind of these events being as good as they were. Like, these matches were good. It was exciting. It was really fun. I enjoyed watching it. So, uh... You know, it's a good time, and I think that this was one of those things that I watched the end of the tournament in the, the end of last year. Um, I watched the finals, and this year I was traveling from the majority of it, but I did catch uh, the final uh, few matches of the tournament. Uh, the finals, um, the NYXL Academy match versus, uh, I don't remember the star something. I am so sorry. I don't remember the name of the team. Um, and the Dart Monkeys Timeless Ethereal game. I saw some of that. Um, but it was it's nice to see. I love Calling All Heroes. I think it's a great event. Um, I'm hoping to be a little less busy for the next uh, tournament uh, weekend so I can catch it then. But, you know, it's a good thing uh, to see, and I'm really glad with what we got from the beginning of this tournament. Finally, like I said, I want to talk a bit about NYXL Academy. I specifically want to mention them because it's good to see a, a team in the Overwatch League reinvesting in the Overwatch uh, contender system. NA in particular has been really bad. There's not really been a uh, an Academy team in a while. Uprising Academy, obviously, uh, I don't think they exist anymore, but they were what, really the last bastion of it. Uh, you know, you had stuff like Montreal Rebellion and uh, Envy, uh, you know, NRG, stuff like that. You had some teams for a while, XL2 in the past, but most of them have kind of faded away and fallen to the wayside. Uh, there's not really a lot of investment anymore. But there's been quite a bit of investment in calling all heroes rosters uh, from Overwatch League teams. And so it's nice to see that the 
New York Excelsior and NYXL Academy are also investing in contenders and calling the heroes as a group and giving those players the opportunity to compete in both uh, tournaments, in both, you know, the contenders circuit and calling the heroes. So that's really nice to see. It's really good to kind of see how uh, the, the league and teams are investing as best they can in the Overwatch scene in the tier two scene and i think it's really good to see that's really it though for this video i'm sure i missed some stuff obviously there was the drama with the boston uprising that happened and there's some rumors about roster signings but i don't want to talk about like drama and rumors and stuff like that so that's a whole thing we can talk about some of that when we get into the video tomorrow when i'm going to give my picks for the week but yeah, that's really it. Let me know your thoughts in the comments down below and anything I talked about today. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time on that YouTube topic, which I think is probably the most interesting one. Um, like I said, a link to Uber's video in the description, if I didn't mention that before, um, a link to it in the description when I check it out. It's like an hour and a half long, but I highly recommend you listen to it because he makes a lot of great points. He talks about things in a really good way. And I think generally speaking, I agree with his stance. And if you want a more kind of nuanced and actual... Um, kind of lengthy discussion on that and, and get to kind of see some other kind of sides to it, I recommend that video. But yeah, that's it for today. Nick, once again, stay tuned tomorrow for finally getting to the week one picks. Uh, but that's all for me today. Thank you all once again. Hope you're all staying safe and staying healthy. And until next time, bye-bye.